Hello and welcome back to Book and Page. We are on to chapter 7 of All Quiet on the Western Front and this is another long chapter. So as always we'll start with a brief summary of what happened in this chapter and then talk about things in a little more depth. So the company needs to be reorganized because they're missing a lot of people. So they actually stop at a field depot in order to do that. Himmeltoss is also there, and he's trying real hard, you guys, to sort of make it up with everybody. Most people are willing to give it to him because he's also taking over for the cook who's going on leave, and is willing to give them some extra rations. Uh, when you're not in the front, you can't think about the front. Like, that's Paul at the very beginning of this chapter to sort of explain why this entire chapter is not just a spiral of, like, fear and anger and loathing over what just happened. You gotta put it out of your head or you're gonna go mad. Krupp and Paul end up finding a movie poster that has a very pretty woman on it, and they end up considering the woman for a while. As luck would have it, when they go sw swimming in the canal later, they actually meet three women, and it's decided they're going to sneak over to visit with the, the three French women they just met. In order to do so, they take some food with them, because that's really what the women want. And because there's three women and four guys, they have to get Tijin very drunk and have him pass out so they can sneak off without him. Yep. They over end up over speaking with the women and enjoying their company. Paul was very attracted by the brunette, she seems really pretty, but the entire thing sort of makes him uncomfortable and he ends up leaving actually really unhappy. This is made even worse because he finds out he's going on leave and when they go to visit the women again, she just doesn't react to it. Like she doesn't care, he's less interesting in that moment and he just kind of has to come to terms with that. Crump and Kat come to see him off, and the journey surprises Paul quite a bit because for a while it's just really boring, but when the scenery becomes familiar, he's actually very startled by his reaction. When he comes home, his reaction even gets worse because he actually freezes up entirely when he hears his sister call for their mother that Paul has returned. He is able to break out of this, but only after his sister sees him crying, and he's able to come around and sort of just... Well, get me a handkerchief then. Also, is mom sick? Because unfortunately, mom is ill. She's been laid up in bed, and they believe it might be cancer. But she is happy to see Paul, and she's one of the few people that doesn't ask him a lot of hard questions. The question she does ask, though, Paul cannot tell her how bad it actually is on the front and ends up lying about it to her. And it turns out to practically everybody else he meets. Paul and the civilians he is in around are just not clicking anymore. Even the ones in the army. He ends up accidentally walking by a superior without saluting, and the superior does, in fact, punish him for it, and then makes it sound like those back home have it worse than the soldiers. His father, all he wants to hear about is horrible hand-to-hand -hand fighting, which he finds interesting, which Paul won't talk about, because again, you can't think about the front when you're not there. And in general, the civilians just have this idea that they know the war better than the soldiers fighting it, and if you guys could just bug up and, uh, push through the French lines real quick. We could finish this war, thank you very much. Paul is not having a very good time. Even his old room is not accepting of him and his books hold no more joy for him. In fact, the best time he has while on leave is off visiting the training grounds where one of his old schoolmates now has their schoolmaster in his training regiment and absolutely enjoys embarrassing the poor man. Despite the fact that the schoolmaster has actually threatened to ruin the man's exams past this point, but the schoolmate is beyond caring. We're at war, and you take what you can, give nothing back. 
Paul does make sure to go and visit Kimmerich's mother and ends up lying to her as well about how her son died, insisting and even swearing that he won't come back if he lies that Kemmerich died instantly. The last night of his leave, Paul's mother ends up sneaking into his room and sitting up with him, and finally Paul has to pretend to wake up to tell her to go back to bed, but she's just worried about everything. Again, he reassures her, lies a little bit, sends her off to bed, and realizes he never should have come home in the first place. This is actually a really interesting chapter because it's another longer chapter that follows chapter 6, which is just a whole lot of death and destruction. And chapter 7 is precisely not that. We see Paul behind the lines talking with the enemy, essentially. The three women are French while he is German. And then we see him on leave as well. So we like to think, ah, that was all the suffering, and now this is the reward for having survived all that. Except it doesn't work out that way. Enrique is not willing to play with this idea that if you do the right thing, in any sense of the word, you get rewarded for it. Because when you just take a look at how this chapter plays out, especially when it comes to him speaking to civilians of his hometown while on leave, they precisely don't understand what's happening. So their concept of doing the right thing has no regard for what these soldiers are actually going through. So while Paul did the right thing yesterday, yesterday, the previous few days while on the front in dealing with the enemy, in returning fire, in doing a counter charge, in surviving in general, all of those things, you think, okay, and now this is the downtime that's going to make all of that worth it. But that's precisely, like I said, not what's happening here. Everything is undercut and uncomfortable, and Paul really doesn't know where to put his feet to keep himself standing. And this starts kind of early on and it becomes more real throughout the chapter. Because we start with precisely a fake version. It is Paul and Crumps looking at the poster of the woman from a movie and talking about whether or not they would have had a chance. And they're just like, yeah, well, we would de-louse. I've got white pants at home. And it's sort of this weird moment where they're looking at this woman who's precisely an artifice. And trying to discuss it in terms of, like, where they are in life. Because they're precisely too real. They are soldiers at war. They're covered in lice. They're uniforms are dirty, they're uncouth, and you see this when Tijin and Leering, I think it's Leering that joins them, um, when they come along, because they're, they're precisely uncouth, right? Which Paul just says is something you have to get used to as a soldier. But it's not what he's interested in at the moment. Yeah, Lear. So Lear and Tijin come along with this poster and precisely get uncouth. Which, yeah, every now and then, uh, Paul and Kromp will join them. It's just not what they want right now. Because it is sort of this idea of actually effectively getting with the woman, not just commenting on what she looks like or what you would do with her if she were real. It is sort of this idea of, if we cleaned up a bit, would be, we be of interest to women our age. Well, that's sort of the interesting thing, because we've gone from this absolutely horrible situation where you are fighting to survive, but you're also arguably fighting for Germany as a country. So this idea that 
women would throw yourself, throw themselves at you as this young warrior type is a story you want to tell yourself, right? That's one of those ideas that we get rewarded for all the suffering afterwards because women love a hero. Women love a man with scars. Women love a bad boy, right? But right from the movie poster, Paul recognizes this really isn't how it translates because he, despite his storytelling, is unafraid to admit of precisely who he is and how that's got to appear to other people. This dirty, lousy soldier. Because that doesn't matter to any of these other soldiers because you're all in the same situation. But to somebody who has never been in that situation, it would terrify them and disgust them. And he's recognized this with the recruits and in some ways he can recognize it when it comes to women as well. But it doesn't mean he's not going to try. So immediately we get this swimming in the canal moment and these three women across the water and how pretty they are and they're calling out to them, they're making jokes, they're trying their best to speak French, which means immediately both sides are aware they're actually enemies at this point. And that's the communication they end up having. Neither group can actually move to visit the other one. They get in trouble if they cross the canal, especially in daylight. But what's really interesting is that the women aren't super interested until Tijin pulls out a loaf of bread and holds it up. Well, again, that's all of this suddenly becomes desperately artifact. And artificial because the women aren't interested in the men themselves they're interested in the food but it is a step closer in a lot of ways to reality and is perhaps the most real that these soldiers are going to get because they're actually women who are also living closer to the front and living in desperate situations. That's why the food is so much more attractive to them than the men are, because it's the food they're in desperate need of. So what are you willing to do? So the connection they actually have in these moments is probably the most understanding that they're going to have. And it's actually between enemies. It is actually between German soldiers and women of France. But it's not a question of your nationality in the moment. It is, in fact, a question of where you're surviving and where you're living. I'm really sorry. The cat has just insisted on joining me today. And, uh being a little intrepid adventurer, so the camera's just going to keep vaguely jiggling as I keep going because she doesn't want my attention, she just wants to move, I guess. She doesn't like me talking about this. She knows this makes me sad, um, and I think she's trying to make me feel better as much as she can without always realizing it makes my videos harder to do. Right. So what's really interesting with this moment with the French women is we are seeing a connection in the experiences we've had, not a connection of us versus them. But would this happen with French men? Oh no, no it wouldn't. This is happening precisely because the women are women. And that's what Paul and his friends really want right now. An honest to God connection with some women after everything they've suffered. But that connection is precisely made through shared suffering. Those food shortages 
that means the women see the bread and think, okay, yeah, we can deal with a couple German men for a night. Come, bring, bring the food, bring the food. Even if the men are uncouth, even if they don't actually talk the same language, they'll work through it. But what's interesting is that the women are painted in sort of this dual way, where their first interest is the food that the soldiers bring, but they're also interested in them as soldiers themselves. This is that little idea of women love the soldier, because when they go back to visit the second night, and Paul tells the brunette that he's going on leave, she's not interested in him anymore. It's not a good story. If he was saying something like, maybe I'm heading to the front and I might not come back, well then maybe that would be a lot more interesting. Or at least that's the story Paul is telling himself. Truth be told, I don't think these women are very interested in any direct way except really with the food and what they have to do to get the food. Because what Paul and his friends are forgetting is that they, if they brag about heading to the front, they're fighting the French. Those women have to recognize these men may, heading to the front means they'll be actively trying to kill French citizens who might even come from that town, might be even related to the women. But it's a lot easier to say, oh, she just wants a cool story, than have to address the moral implications of these women accepting German men into their home and what connections they're actually making. Are these women trying to see past country lines and see these men as human? Or are they simply striving to find food wherever they can and doing things that would make them uncomfortable. It is sort of this weird question of how much agency the women have in the situation that we're never going to know about because this is a story told from Paul's perspective. So what the women are doing and feeling, well, that's the hard question. But it's a lot easier for Paul to say, oh yeah, she just doesn't, she's not into it because I'm going on leave. Not, she's not into it because we're the enemy invading her country. You understand what I mean? But th truth be told, that's the way these men have to think. No one wants to sit there after all of the horrible things they've gone through and ask themselves if they're the bad guy. All of these accounts are going to be from the perspective of maybe people who are recognizing this isn't the right way to do it, but they're never going to sit there and ask themselves, am I wrong for doing it? Because that's simply not a question you can entertain in these moments. The moment you're thinking like that, you'll go mad, right? It's just like thinking about the front when you're away from it. You're just trying to survive. And survivor's guilt is going to become a problem. It's actually brought up with Kemmerich's mother, who demands to know why he, Paul, is alive and Kemmerich, her son, is dead. Well, that's not a question Paul can ask himself. He's just trying to survive. And the moment you start wondering, is it worth it if I survive? Am I the bad guy here? Do those people deserve to survive more than me? Like I said, you're going to go mad. You're going to despair and everything is going to collapse. So these like honest, minute, moral details kind of have to get shoved aside and ignored. Because what is the point of everything you're going through if it's not going to result the way you want it to? The other night I actually watched a beautiful animated movie about Japanese citizens during World War II. If I have the name correctly, I believe it's this corner of the universe. 
and it was precisely about Japanese civilians going through food shortages, going through dealing with bombs dropping, losing family members and friends, losing body parts. The main woman actually loses a hand at the same time that she loses her one and only niece. And then of course it is from the Japanese perspective. So the Hiroshima bomb goes off, the woman's family is actually from Hiroshima, and she loses most of her family in that bomb. The Nagasaki bomb goes off, and then Japan surrenders. And it is sort of this horrifying moment for them, where the question is, if we've lost the war, what was all the suffering for? And it's an absolutely heartbreaking movie that was really wa interesting to watch in tandem with All Quiet on the Western Front, precisely because, again, it's a perspective that you don't necessarily think about. But thinking about the moral details of all of this and trying to figure out, are we the good guy? Are we the bad guy? Are we doing the right thing? Should I be obeying these orders? Should I not? That's not something a soldier can ask themselves in that moment. They're just following orders so they can survive. But that's the question of Eichmann in Jerusalem. The entire trial of Eichmann following World War II was how much you as somebody taking orders have agency to disobey those. How much you as a soldier are responsible for when you lose the war and it's decided morally that you are in the wrong. Which is a weird question for us to be asking, but it's one of those things that's going to haunt us throughout the rest of the book. Because again, Enric starts with this is not a confession nor an accusation. But as we go through, the moral implications of war can't just stay, I think, on that broad level of war in general. When you're reading about particular people, you are going to start thinking about the moral implications of those particular moments. But we have to keep in mind that we have hindsight. We have history between us and World War I now. We also have me personally. I'm from Canada. So we're the victors in these war, arguably. So that's another perspective we have to keep in mind. I've never been a soldier. So asking all of these questions is effectively me asking them from the outside, not from the inside. And Eric actually sort of warns against this in some really interesting ways when Paul goes on leave. Because everybody he's meeting, for the most part, is precisely from that outside perspective. The people who make the judgment calls about worth and what needs to be done without having once actually experienced anything that Paul's gone through, right? So it starts with simple things. It's the Red Cross lady handing out coffee, who Paul looks at and says like, she's literally here because it makes her look good. Like she doesn't have any idea of the suffering he's gone through that she should be there trying to alleviate. She's self-important in this moment. It's her father, his father that just wants to hear about hand-to-hand -hand combat and how exciting it is and all the men he's killed. It's about his German instructor from school and all his friends talking about how if you just push through that one front, we can take France easy and the war will end. Oh, you wouldn't know anything about it. Details, of course. But you don't see the grand picture. If we just won here and here, the war would be over. We are that outside perspective. And Enrique is warning us against taking on too pompous of a view. 
taking on this idea that we know exactly who's right and who's wrong in all of this because we're a step back. We're not even a step back. We are like 50,000 steps back. Because the people we're meeting here are various steps back. Like we meet some people who have been in the war. His old schoolmate, who's now training people. Well, that's sort of a step back because that's a man precisely using power he's been given to embarrass somebody that previously embarrassed him. But that's a man not, again, thinking about the fact that he's been on the front, these men will have to go to the front, and he needs to train them to deal with that when the time comes. He spends more of his time actually humiliating his old schoolmaster than he does, it seems, training the man to survive the horrors he's going to be facing. The superior officer that Paul meets that punishes him for not saluting correctly is even more steps back because he says things like, oh, it's worse here. Paul notices as he's traveling up via train that like, he reaches a point where there's no more shell holes, no more trenches. Things are actually put together. There are some food restrictions and restrictions on other materials, but he's literally looking around at full houses that haven't been bombed and things like that. So being told to his face that it's worse here than there. And then there's that group that's discussing how the war can be ended properly. But it's a different type of discussion than from Crompt and Cat discussing this previously, because they also had this discussion about what needed to happen with the war. But they have it from the perspective of the soldiers, which for the most part resulted in we just have one person from each group fight each other, and whoever survives, that side wins. Well, from these civilians that aren't involved in the fighting, it's like chuck more men at the problem. You guys just buck up and break through there, it'll be fine. They're not thinking about the horrors we just saw in the last chapter. They're so separate from this entire outcome in the trenches that they have this idea that if the soldiers would just work a little harder, we'd all be fine. We wouldn't have to deal with these silly restrictions. Of course, Paul finishes this up by wishing that he hadn't come back. Everything here is so completely alien from him that he doesn't know how to deal with it. Which is actually a really interesting question that we then have to think about when it comes to history and the war actually ending. How do you take people who have seen the absolute worst of humanity and partaken in that terrible part of human nature and put them back in a peaceful situation? How do we prevent anything from this, like this happening again without making them all go mad from those moral questions that we've started asking ourselves? How do we connect with these people on a human level without necessarily buying into the idea of war as a necessity? How do we include heroes like Achilles back into a peaceful society? And truth be told, a lot of war media, that's not a question they often ask themselves. The unfortunate truth, and spoiler alert here for All Quiet on the Western Front, is that most of these men don't make it back. The unfortunate truth of something like the Iliad is that your answer is they die in the battle. And then we don't have to answer that question. The people who eventually do get home are the ones 
that are the thinkers, that can think their way out of it. They're not the ones who did most of the fighting because they're warriors and that was what they were told to do. We're going to hit the end of this book and it's still going to be a question. How do you take broken men who have survived a war and have them keep living in a world that's been changed by the war? Especially if their side didn't win. I'm going to keep reading and I hope you do too. See you next time.